pony aspect. Ignore the art. This week on Backward Compatible, Doc, Chris, and Eric help Jim pick out the tabletop role-playing system that might work best for his group of players. Plus, from dusk to Casa Bonita, the Fallout board game, Seed Ship, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 127 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy, y'all. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Eric. Hello again. And today we're talking about uh, choosing a system in tabletop RPGs. Uh, Jim, this is something that you brought up to us uh, before we started the show, how you're having a little bit of trouble finding a system that works well for your group. And so we were going to have a discussion about um, not just helping you solve that problem, but then speaking more generally about uh, how one goes about choosing the right game for your group. Uh, this is something that Doc and I obviously have uh, some experience in. Uh, yeah, we're like total experts. <laughs> see also the Doc and Kruger cast. And so I think this will be a fun uh, just fun discussion and a fun way to kind of solve both the real world problem and uh, t- teach a few things to our, to our listeners, mm-hmm. or at least to give our opinions on it. So should be fun. And promote our other podcast, which... Uh, <laughs> awesome. Subtle plug, subtle plug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, not subtle that was at all. So smooth. <laughs> <laughs> so smooth. Uh, anyway, but first we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I've been uh, actively avoiding games for these past few weeks um, in, in anticipation for Yakuza 6, which comes out next week. Uh, but first, the one game that I actually did play um, is a DLC to South Park, The Fractured But Whole. I did pronounce that correctly, by the way. No, you um, didn't. It's not, it's not actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's intentionally meant to sort of evoke a, uh, a little uh, saucy language there. Um, which actually is a game that I enjoyed quite a bit. It's an RPG. It is the sequel to The Stick of Truth, um, another RPG that I enjoyed uh, with the South Park crew. Which is not dirty at all. No, not at all. Of course not. Um, And unlike The Stick of Truth, um, Fractured But Whole is a superhero parody. So you have the characters in their superhero garb, like Hartman as the kin. I think I said it similar. The kin. Yeah. And then uh, um, Kenny as uh, the, the surprisingly talkative Mysterion. Um, Etc. So multiple multiple characters within that, of course, going up against Doctor Chaos, uh, Professor Chaos, excuse me, um, which is Butters along with other villains. Um, a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with it, and, and and of course the big appeal is the not just the humor but also the graphics. Um, Stick of Truth was the same way, but it feels like you're actually playing an episode of South Park, which is really fun for uh, South Park fans. So recently they released their newest DLC um, from Dusk till Casa Bonita. Hmm. And those that remember the Casa Bonita episode, Casa Bonita, yeah, Casa Bonita. yeah. <laughs> remember that episode of South Park was uh, essentially it's this um, Tex-Mex, not really Tex-Mex, but Mexican restaurant in Colorado um, that does exist, by the way. Um, it is a real place. And it's a very beautiful house. Uh, no, it's actually not. I know that's what it means in Spanish, but no, it's not. It's actually a restaurant. I'm sure they don't expect anyone in, Co- in Colorado to know what it means. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a apparently it doesn't have very good food. It's more for the attraction. It's almost like a theme park mixed yes. with a restaurant. It's the beautiful house. Yes. <laughs> um, and it's it's essentially, um, of course, they have all the typical Mexican fare, but they also have like an indoor water uh, water uh, fall that you can dive, that they have people, professionals dive off. Um, they have some guy dressed up as like a monkey in a monkey suit. Or I think he's like a gorilla suit or something. What? It's a typical yeah. Tex-Mex it's restaurant so, fare. Yeah. That's what, <laughs> right. That's what I said. It's not really Tex. It's a Colorado f- Max or whatever. Um, it's 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 a, apparently a real place, but the episode, of course, of South Park made fun of it even more. Um, I've actually heard rumors that uh, the the restaurant itself um, they have they have to keep track of whenever Comedy Central re-airs that episode because they always have a huge spike in business hmm. because it reminds people, oh, whoa, this is a real place, I got to go to it, and they get a bunch of extra people. Um, so this episode, um, this DLC, which is essentially just an extra um, mission for. Um, 
South Park, the fractured butt hole, allows you to take your superhero character that you've created, um, of course, the new guy, just like from Stick of Truth, with your own power set. You get to go to Casa Bonita, um, and you get to team with both uh, the Coon and Mysterion in order to try to rescue Mysterion's little sister. She's fallen in with the Vamp Kids. Who are, who are going to turn her into a vampire, of course. That's what vamp kids do. Um, and along the way, you um, also have an alliance, or you form an alliance with a new uh, companion, Henrietta, the goth girl, who has to remind you, of course, that goth and vamp kids are totally different. Goth kids and vamp kids, completely different things. I mean, they are. Yeah, of course, of course. I'm not saying they're not. Um, <laughs> yeah, va uh, vamp kids don't drink coffee and smoke cigarettes, right? They drink blood, right? There you go. One goes to Hot Topic, the other goes to Spencer's. There you go. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Um, so the game itself um, is actually a lot of fun. It actually plays in terms of running length uh, almost exactly five hours. I actually timed it. I was very careful to get my playing time before you start at the end of wherever your last save was, which for me was beating the game, the first game, um, or the original game. And so it almost took me exactly five hours. And I took my time, so I'm sure you can beat it in probably more like three if you try. It came across in terms of the story beats like one episode of South Park. Hmm. So um, it does give you an extra power set, the Netherborn powers, which I used almost exclusively until towards the very end when I started multi-classing again, mainly because I wanted to try the new powers. And Netherborn powers are kind of similar to a, a Necromancer a power set. So um, very interesting. The storyline was... Of course, South Park inspired with a lot of humor, a lot of weirdness. Of course, they have the uh, bathroom humor as usual, um, which is just a part of the show. Um, and a uh, special peer appearance by uh, Michael Jackson, who comes back <laughs> from the dead. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, they kind of have a, a Lost Boys parody came running back throughout for the it. Children. Yes, he does actually. He comes back for the children. Yeah, that's what it um, and of course, they have the uh, the uh, Lost Boys parody running throughout. If you if anyone's familiar with that yeah, uh, old vampire film, um, it bites. It does. Well, get some it, of them do. Get it? Uh, but uh, my my one concern on this, and I've I've heard some people criticizing it for its price because it is about uh, twelve thirteen dollars. I think it's twelve ninety nine. Um, seems a little pricey for what you're getting with five hours of content. I will say that uh, it could have been priced less. But if you're a fan of South Park and you like the gameplay, I still think it's well worth trying. Um, it is like an extended South Park episode. So check it out. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Had a chance to play Fallout the board game the other day. The board game? The board game indeed. Were you bored? No, I was not bored. I was confused. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, actually, I was deeply confused. Um, and, you know, there, there's always the that moment where you're playing someone else's game where you kind of wonder... Hey, are, are they not explaining it right? Are we missing rules here? And you pick up the rules and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, they misunderstood this word it's badly, you know, whatever. And you try to explain it and then you're like, ah, uh, we'll just go with it. It's consistent, whatever. And I kept, that kept happening and I got, you know, confused. And so I knew there was a really solid, really exciting, really good game there. And the other day I had a chance to pick it up for 20% off new. So I did. And I uh, brought it to game night, and because we'd already played one game of it, I thought to myself, well, we'll just go ahead and play it through. If we have a question, we'll consult the rules. It'll be fine. We played it almost completely differently, and it was still wrong. Um, and it was to the point where we basically had to call the game we were playing, start over, reset everything, and start again. Um, now, I haven't even talked about the game itself yet, but here's, here's the fundamental problem with it. The game rules are badly written and they're split. And it's this new thing that some of the games are doing where they give you kind of a how to play this game version of the game. And that's in one book. And then a let's call it a glossary, sort of an alphabetical index of game ideas for uh, how to play the game more in a more complicated way. And that's in the second book. And that's what they've done here. Now, this is Fantasy Flight, and I've come to expect great, great things from Fantasy Flight games. But in this case, they've really, really dropped the ball hmm. on the rules here. And I don't know if it's because there was just too much influence from Bethesda. Jim, you can insert your comments here. Um, or if, you know, if it was just that particular team was thinking in too much in terms of, uh, let's call it a simulationist approach of um, trying to mimic what was happening in the in the video game or what, but I find it odd that they, that they tried to take so much from 
specific video games as opposed to just thinking about the system itself well, fallout, and the world of fallout you know, that's what i find like an odd choice well and, really. and i think narratively they did a really fantastic job of uh, the way the quests work and everything like that it actually there's branching narrative it's it it really hinges on your decisions. It feels like there's a, let's call it a morality system. It's not about good and bad, though. It's about choosing a faction. Uh, so maybe a faction system would be a better way to say it. Um, I like that. And, and I mean, like bloat flies will chase you halfway across the map. Uh, <laughs> you know, and so there's a lot of stuff in there that just really feels right. Um, but one of the things that could have been done better right out of the gate is the way the leveling works because it's got the special system and you see it and you can slot in the S-P-E-C-I-A-L and you're like, yeah, it's Fallout, right? But the way that it works is you pick two at random, random, Jim, hmm. and then you choose which one you want to keep. And then it slots. And then it's basically, um, if you pull a, um, like a mission or a card or an encounter or something, it's going to say, do you have L? If you do, you can re-roll. Or you can choose to do this other thing that won't require a roll. What do you do? And in that sense, it has a little bit of a uh, Arabian Nights feel to it by Xenon yeah. Games. Yeah. And that it's Arabian... what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Tales of the Arabian Nights. Um, the, one of the criticisms of that game is that it's just too random. You can't really make meaningful decisions. And... The problem is that that's the way that it feels here in Fallout 2, unfortunately, is that you can try to make meaningful decisions, but you may not be successful. You can try mm. to make, you know, let's call them aligned decisions, because I don't really want to want to stress the morality aspect of it. But at the same time, you can do stuff like, do I, uh, oh, you encounter, you encounter a, a woman who is um, yelling at her dog and kicking it. What do you do? Do you tell her to stop? Do you... Um, you know, oh, I thought you were asking me. I was about to tell well, you. No, no. And that's the thing. It's, it gives you three options. Do you ignore her and go shopping? Um, or do you, you pull do, out the big boy? Right. Exactly. And so... Yeah, I would have pulled out... What was the, the mini nuke? Uh, the, big boy. Yeah, the big well, boy. Well, that's the thing is if you don't have the right stats, you may not succeed at that role. And so the dog might just run off. And it is dog meat, by the way. Spoilers. Mm. Um, but... You, if you do any of that, basically you're going to forfeit your opportunity to go shopping, which is a game mechanic. Mm. That's the whole reason you went to town was to go shopping. You can't just say, I'm going to town and I'm going to do a shopping action. You're, you're going to town and you're doing an encounter and the encounter might allow you to shop. Huh. And so in that sense, it, it feels, honestly, it feels like I play Fallout, which is, okay, I'm going to go into this new place and I'm going to sell my stuff and then I get distracted. <laughs> Right. So maybe maybe it was a little too successful in in, in mimicking the uh, the game that aspect cycle. of the video game, like the gameplay itself of the video game. When really, as a board game, it, it probably shouldn't have. Yeah. So this, here's the thing: it nails the tone. It absolutely nails it. It it it, lo it sounds like or it, it feels like it's going to uh, chew you up and spit you out if you go a little too far too fast. Some of the ways that they control the difficulty, considering it's random card pulls, is absolutely brilliant because it's um. It's basically got a variable. It's like, um, okay, you can sell the same number of items as the stat of the town you're in right now, which if it's a low-level town, you can only buy or sell one thing. But if it's a major town, like Diamond City, you can buy and sell four things. Some of that stuff is really, really clever. Um, but the rules being so badly written make it very, very difficult to know how to play right out of the gate. That said, we finally figured it out. And ultimately, now that I know how to play after the third iteration of trying, it's actually incredibly well done. And it is a lot of fun. And as a uh, Fallout fan, what I really love about it is you can play in the uh, Capital Wasteland scenario. You can play in Boston scenario, Commonwealth. Um, you can play in the Pit. Remember the Pit DLC? I do. Yeah. That was actually a good DLC. Yeah. Or you can play in Far Harbor. And those are kind of the four areas you can play in. And there are fully constructed, incredibly deep storylines. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't say incredibly, but uh, appropriately deep storylines for each of those um, with aligned factions and so on and so forth. So um, in that sense, I think I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this in the future because there's more to say. Um, but right now, I'm really enjoying playing it. And um, I am in no way at all burned out by it. It mm. also has a single player option mode. Cool. And so I'm looking forward to to doing that a little bit and, too. And when does Obsidian come out with the expansion pack that's better than the original game? I don't know, Jim. Okay. I'm just, yeah. just curious. We'll right after bugs, they though. get back together. How about <laughs> sure. that? Well, when they get rushed, of course. <laughs> I'll, I'll call Uncle Fergus. I'll ask him. There you go. What is the Obsidian to Fantasy Flights Bethesda? <laughs> 
This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. Played another mobile game recently. Um, this one is called Seed Ship, and it's actually written by science fiction author John Aliff. And it's actually he created it in Twine. So it's actually a completely text a, a text game. Um, it is a game of interstellar exploration and settlement. And so the idea here is that you the Earth is essentially going to be destroyed or has been destroyed. They don't. I think there there's a, there's an intro that kind of goes into the generalities of it. But essentially, there are one thousand um, settlers that are in this seed ship, and you control the AI of the seed ship, and you've been designed and programmed to um, control the ship and find planets and then determine is this planet suitable for a the settlement of humanity to maintain humanity um or not and you have to continue to look look for planets to settle on until you actually decide to settle down and then you get to just just get to see what happens based on you know multiple factors on the planet so there's all these different stats that planets can have like what is the temperature what is the gravity um what are the resources that are there are there people that Aliens, essentially, that are already there. What's their civilization like? What are the animals, plants, etc.? Um, you have to make that call, and a lot of times you don't have all the information. You can you could launch a space probe to try to get more information about what's there, but you have a limited number of those. And as you're traveling through space, you have all these decisions of, um, uh oh, if I go, if if I travel through this part of space, I might be able to find a pretty interesting planet that might be worth settling on, but I'm going to damage part of my ship for sure. Or, uh-oh, there's a comet coming, and I can either let it hit a certain part of the ship and damage it a lot, or I can try to avoid it. But if I avoid it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break apart, and it might damage multiple parts of my ship slightly. And so you have to keep track of all these things, and sometimes you have to make the difficult decision of, I don't want to mess up my ability to scan for other planets. Or, in order to do that, I have to possibly eliminate some of the people that are in my that charge. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And they're, of course, they're in hyper, I, I should have mentioned, they're in um, cryogenic freeze, so they have no control over anything. Oh. Yes. Uh, but it's very fun. I've already played it three times uh, through all the way through. Um, it's very addictive. Sometimes you survive. Uh, your settlement survives. Sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of times, even if it survives, it's not always the best outcome. It's worth replaying many times. This is Back Talk, where someone shares new thoughts on a previous discussion. On episode 125, so just a couple episodes ago, um, one of the things that, Jim, I believe you brought up um, was regarding uh, in the Overwatch League and kind of in Overwatch in general, uh, discussing uh, kind of the way that they're doling out punishment to like the pro players and kind of how they're uh, kind of trying to control uh, the uh, kind of language and like the quote unquote, the toxicity that exists in online games in general and that, and it kind of, I think, spread out as in a much broader discussion on like kind of um, Twitch chat and like kind of what emotes and memes like mean and like things like that and like um, the interpretation of those and whether or not that's good to try to limit or not, uh, which I think is its own discussion in its own right. But one of the things that I will, and so I'm not going to touch any of those things. Um, one of the, at least not right now, um, but one of the things that I did want to touch on was kind of uh, another perspective on why Blizzard is maybe doing this um, and how they're approaching it, maybe right, maybe wrong. Um, I think that on one hand is we do look at the punishments and why they're handing out certain punishments to certain players. Uh, of course, being here in Dallas, we've seen a lot of the things that have happened with uh, the now uh, retired player, if you will. I, I don't know if he's actually planning on coming back XQC um, in his kind of two punishments that he got. Uh, also another fuel player, Taimu, who once got punished as well around the same time. Um, and then uh, both of those were due to uh, something that was language related um, on the internet typically um, or in an interview or like uh, actually on like their Twitch streams. Um, and so uh, it's kind of this weird element in which the players are actually being interview 24 7 if they will because they still stream like six hours a day after they're done practicing not thinking about the fact that they uh people can actually quote them at those moments um in which uh xqc actually had did an interview that he actually had is some really interesting thoughts on that um that i can get into in a little bit uh but then more recently we also saw um another player for philadelphia for the philadelphia fusion uh eqo um who was recently punished as well um he actually got the same punishment that Taimu got, um, and essentially his was not necessarily for uh, 
something that he said. It was something that he did on a stream. Um, it, it seems like in the long run, uh, from his perspective, there was a little bit of a cultural misunderstanding there. Um, but he essentially on his stream when talking about wanting to aspire to be as good as some of the other Korean players, he uh, kind of did a slant eye um, by like pulling his eyes back. Um, and uh intentional or not, they punished him for it. They fined him for it. Uh, and what was actually particularly interesting about it was Philadelphia, the owner of the Philadelphia Fusion, has actually been quoted before this happened saying that he actually doesn't think that the punishments were actually uh, strong enough because he's really invested in wanting to make sure that this league and that esports in general uh, has a uh, more of an air of professionalism um, that if they're trying to go mainstream um, and that the toxic environments that we do or like kind of some of the trash talking or whatever you want to call it that we get on uh, chats on online games does not necessarily mean that we need to accept that as we go more mainstream because the mainstream audience isn't going to be OK with that. Um, and so what was particularly interesting about that from his perspective is then he uh, actually um, find EQO further as the uh, somebody in the Philadelphia Fusion actually benched him for a certain number of time and then really interestingly uh, actually then banned him from uh, being able to stream on his Twitch channel for the next two months. Um, so this was actually a self-imposed by the team mm -hmm. um, as well. And I say all of that particularly to say I feel like the reason for why they're doing this is um, and I'm, I'm just coming off of a, uh, a long stint of going to a lot of esports panels during uh, startup week, uh, Dallas startup week. Um, by the time this airs, a couple weeks ago, um, and uh, a lot of what they were talking about during that is as we look towards um, a wider audience and a quote unquote more mainstream audience, um, we're they're trying to make sure that they. Um, from uh, the way that their players act to the way that they actually uh, uh, portray the entire league uh, and the way that they present the entire league is going to be fit uh, more of what the mainstream audience would want. And it's the idea of, as we talk about, like uh, with trash talking and things like that, um, it's the idea that you're not going to offend anybody by not saying uh uh, vulgar language. Um, you know, nobody's going to go to a Pixar movie and say, I think that would have been a better movie if they dropped more F bombs. Um, <laughs> <you know? laughs> I mean, it might be. Yeah, right, yeah. I don't um, know. I, I don't know Toy Story that's... 3 was pretty bad. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's true as a but, blanket statement, but I, as, as a, as a, you know, one of the examples that they would bring up is that with advertising, um, you know, there's actually a stat out there that esports actually make 70% of their revenue off ads. Um, because they don't have ticket sales. They don't really have to pay for any of that. And so as they start to work with uh, these bigger non-endemic, uh, so essentially brands that aren't like gaming related brands, these brands are going to expect that they're not going to be supporting something that's going to be offensive yeah, on their side. We've seen as well. what happened with YouTube recently. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, uh, and, and I think that it's also just reflective of what Blizzard has always done of having and wanting to be as inclusive as possible, um, it, you know, from the type of games that they make, even just simply looking at Overwatch of uh, the the hero base that they have of all different races, characters of all different races, of genders, of uh, sexual orientation, of uh, religions. Um, and that's what they want from their fan base. And we've seen that for a long time. And, and so again, and species and robots. And yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so it's, it's just, and so there's the professionalism element. There's the not wanting to offend advertisers because we're wanting to bring more money in because it's only good for everybody. And why would anybody really actually get upset at inclusivity? Um, and um, by doling out some of these punishments in the way that they are and, and maybe not necessarily even censoring because it's, it's a volunteer thing for people to be to play this game and for people to be professionals in it. And they're working for a company and the company is allowed to say what you can and cannot say. And especially, um, again, wanting to make sure that they're presenting something that is going to be inoffensive to a much broader uh, audience of people. And anybody who would want that um, type of environment maybe can still find that somewhere else. And that's kind of I feel that that's kind of their prerogative to do. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Jim, uh, you were telling us about some of the challenges you've had with finding uh, the right game for your uh, role playing group. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, I, I, uh, with, with 
a few of my friends that I've known for many years, um, actually friends from uh, college, my, my first stint at college, I've been twice. So I've known them for, um, oh, geez, almost 20 years now. Um, so I've, gee, you're old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. My first, uh, my first stint in college, uh, began in the year uh, 2000. So I've known them f- and, uh, one of them was my, uh, roommate freshman year at, uh, UT Austin. So, um, and then I, then I learned, I met my other friends through him. Um, so we have since, since pretty much I first knew him have played some role-playing games, but a lot of what we used to do was more free form, kind of a, you know, made up system and kind of just play for a short period of time um until we just kind of run out of ideas and then move on to something else and you know we end up getting killed off in some sort of manner because it's it's fun um but i've been trying to get us more into um a more formalized system that we can run a longer campaign and possibly not fizzle out as quickly but trying to find a system that that fits is difficult we ran um well, we tried for uh, Dungeons and Dragons 4E for a little while, um, mm-hmm. and that was just way too board game like. Um, didn't like that. Uh, we've run some 5E and a couple of different campaigns in 5E, uh, more than a couple actually. I think like three or four short campaigns, not longer ones. But um, we end up having to um, house rule so many things because it's just you have rules for everything, and there's dice rolls for everything, and you have you have such a, a big character sheet even in 5E. Um, I'm not saying it's as big as, um, say, you know, 3.5, uh, 3 or 3.5, but it's still a lot to keep track of. And there's there's too much of a tendency to say, um, oh, I can do that. I, I should be able to roll for that kind of thing. And, and so you, as a GM, um, you kind of have to make a choice. Or am I going to just ignore this rule or, I'm going to, or am I going to allow it and let them roll? And uh, it, it can take away from some of the freedom, which I feel like the, 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 the party likes generally speaking. So I'm looking for a game that is a more free and open. Mm-hmm. I've been doing some research into, um, well, I've tried one of the games that I tried, and I think I talked about it actually on the podcast was a uh, masks, um, an RPG that mm-hmm. is uh, much more narrative, complete opposite of something like D and D, um, which, you know, I thought would be an interesting experiment to try out with, with the group and didn't really take to it at all. Hmm. Um, it is more open, much more abstract, but it still kind of forces you into roles like each player it's it's very um young justice or teen titans inspired kind of characters and roles and you're supposed to play parts in this uh superhero story and they kind of didn't really want to play those roles they wanted to kind of play their own roles and their own parts and the the game kind of breaks down if you don't accept those those um those roles mm. i mean really it's 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 interesting that you would think a game it, it touts itself in being so open and uh you having uh, narrative freedom and oh you can kind of do anything based on what your power, powers are and things like that even though there are mechanics to it and yet it's 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 interesting how quickly it breaks down if you don't mm-hmm. follow those roles now um, those roles. i'm forgetting exactly isn't masks based on the power by the apocalypse system yeah i believe it is yeah the thing you get with that and i think that um powered by the apocalypse as a as a kind of a series if you will um as an engine for these sorts of games is really good at um guiding people down a particular path um, to help them think about storytelling or developing their characters in a particular sort of way in order to achieve a certain sort of experience. Um, so I feel like it is generally pretty open ended, but it's more like working within uh, guardrails, if that makes sense. Yes, it, um, it does. So like if you're willing to embrace the I am this archetype um, and then maybe doing some interesting stuff within that archetype, um, it totally allows you to do that. But to your point, um, if you're wanting to do something completely different, Um, you know, aside maybe from being able to combine uh, some of your moves with special moves from other classes, which takes a long time in the game to get to that point, um, you have to kind of start thinking about doing custom hacks or finding custom hacks that people have done that kind of match your style. Mm -hmm. And so in the sense of making a totally original character that is like that will behave the way do not steal that that will behave in the way that you're kind of wanting to take it. You got to have a more open ended system. Um, than say powered by the apocalypse, which uh-huh. is trying to give you a particular sort. Of yeah, experience. that's exactly right. Well, there are other factors too. You you have to figure out whose story are you telling. Are you telling the GM's story or are you telling the the character's story? Right. I think that was the issue with masks. Is that really you're telling? Um, it's not. Re- I would argue, and some people might disagree that have played the game. I don't think you're telling the player's story. I think you're playing the GM story. Mm-hmm. Um, even though the players, the players have roles in that story and they're, they're characters in that story. And they have some control. It's still ultimately a GM driven story. Yeah. 
So I think whenever you look at something classic like Dungeons and Dragons, ultimately you're you're looking at a system that is modular in a very specific way. And it's, hey guys, I've got this great new module. It's this great new scenario. It's this whatever, whatever. Come play it. See if you can solve the mystery that I'm going to put in the table tonight. And you you know before you even start that the answers are in the book. The options are in the book. It's almost like a really, really complicated choose your own adventure story. Now that doesn't do it justice because there's a there's so many places where you could insert your own content. In right. fact, I think it's it's pretty obvious that Dungeons and Dragons was always assumed from the very beginning that a GM would insert their own content. But it was also created around this idea of maybe you're not a storyteller and you want to tell a story. Here's here's how you can do that. And this is going to give you the tools to be able to do that. If you don't know, look it up. Here's the stats. Here's a character. Here's the answer to that question. Here's that path that the characters have done that, that have gone off in a strange direction. That, I think, is the conceit of Dungeons & Dragons. Some of the more open-ended stories, the the sort of indie stuff that's coming out nowadays, the stuff that uh, you know Kruger and I, Chris, mm-hmm. and I uh, do, is very... Well, I, I think the conceit that's there, and there's a conceit there too, is that the GM has uh, the ability to do improv and make stuff up on the spot, that that there's not going to be a set answer in the book yeah. before you start. And I'm glad you brought that up because mm-hmm. that's kind of where my um, investigation, my research kind of took me was um, that concept, but looking at it from the the... the old school D&D approach, mm-hmm. which apparently was a lot like that. And I I actually didn't have any experience playing um, original D&D and basic set D&D. Yeah. I just had advanced D&D and then three onward were kind of was my experience and only a little bit of, of advanced, by the way. So I didn't really under, realize that it was like that, but apparently it was a lot more of that kind of open-ended um, um, style, abstract style, where you're not expected to, like for, to use a, a I think, probably the most um, recognizable example. Um, If you go into a room and say 5e and you're trying to say investigate for traps or, or um, something interesting in the room, maybe there's a puzzle to solve or something you would use your, you know, your spot check and you'd roll dice and you'd Mm kind of see what you get. Um, But in the, you know, old style D and D you wouldn't be able to do that. There is no spot check. So you actually would describe, Hey, okay, what's in the room. And then you would say what you're going to do. And, you know, potentially you would, you would find, that that trap or that you know interesting piece of puzzle or whatever it is and there would be no rolls at all and the whole thing would kind of play out with zero rolling right so i found that to be just reading that kind of uh concept and and internalizing it to me feels like maybe that's the direction that i'm, I'm going and um kind of find found it interesting that there's kind of a renaissance going or going on related to these uh, the old school uh Dungeons and Dragons, where there's yeah, a bunch of different. like retro, uh, they call them retro clones, essentially. You there's, might have heard of them. Actually, yeah. There yeah, actually is true, actually. A, a whole movement right now yeah. in the RPG publishing space called OSR, Old School Renaissance. Oh, right. Yes. I'm going I'm to pretend I coined that. <laughs> yeah. Where there are, um, there are games that are very specifically designed to draw out, um, not necessarily like just recreating old games as they were, but um, some of the things that old games would do or the the sort of experiences they would evoke uh in some senses almost like playing games now that remind you of what you remember not necessarily what you don't remember yeah that's yeah. And, and i found a, a few examples of that specifically which i'm i might i might try all three just to kind of see which one sticks um because they all seem to be at least free initially in terms of uh initial play and then you can buy more modules and things like that uh so swords and wizardry it's one of them that seems pretty highly regarded mm-hmm. Um, then there's Labyrinth Lord, which is kind of similar. Um, and then there's a, a third one that tends to be more uh, described as more uh, weird with some occult influences called Lamentations of the Flame Princess or Fire Princess. Oh, goodness. That sounds familiar, actually. Yeah. I so all, all three of those are kind of meant to be um, retro Dungeons and Dragons clones, mm-hmm. which um, and, and sort of played in that kind of style. So um, that's something I'm going to experiment with, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm always open for, for more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess the next question after whose story are you telling would be, for me anyway, a, a genre question. Yeah. I mean, if if you are obviously playing in a fantasy setting, in other words, you're doing a, let's call it Lord of the Rings pastiche, mm-hmm. right? Um, 
then that's going to limit your options greatly. You're either going to have to go with something that is intended to be fantasy, and then that brings you into things like Pathfinder and, and some of the obvious choices like that, um, or into something that's genre agnostic. And, um, you know, you, you can find, oh, like the, one of the classics would be GURPS and that kind of a mm. thing, right? Um, but a lot of the, I guess, more niche stuff is going to be very specific to a genre. You know what I mean? It's going to um, take you into a specific type of sci-fi world or something like that. And so those are going to be off the table then, if that's what you're if you're looking for. Um, beyond that, if it might be assumed that you're looking for a system you're going to keep for a long time and that you're going to play for years. And so um, that's going to change things a little bit. So my my top three in answer to your your question, essentially, would be if you're looking for something narrative that feels like Lord of the Rings, you could go for uh, Fellowship, which is just tell the story until you need to uh, call upon something, and then that's when you play from your playbook. My only concern with that would be, though, that it, it is also powered by the apocalypse. Yes. And so if you didn't like masks, you might not like Fellowship for some of the same reasons. Correct. Now, I will say that with that in mind, um, they might find the fit of the archetypes um, of the, the, the move sets to mm -hmm. um, be a little bit more intuitive because yeah. what you're playing is a race as opposed to necessarily like a type of superhero. Um, now, even with that being said, um, there are still archetypal elements. And so they're the archetypes of your Lord of the Rings pastiches. Absolutely. Um, for example, there is the, uh, the Harbinger, basically your Gandalf. Um, there is the, uh, the air, which is kind of your Aragorn, your sort of party leader in a sense. Um, and they sort of do their own thing with it. And there are actually a few options if you wanted to sort of like run it by people, see if they're interested. Yeah. Um, each archetype has like kind of different things. You could see if it, uh, like say like three different versions of this, um, this class. Yeah. And it changes a little bit how they play and kind of the direction you're taking it. Um, and some of those directions will take it further away from the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. example. So that is one to to look at, but I would be cautious for the same reasons that you yeah. mentioned. Like the, the halfling that I played was, uh, he was the size of a Smurf. Basically, he was two apples high, right? Mm -hmm. A very different thing. I, basically, I went with the, the the idea of the brownies from Willow, mm -hmm. if you know that old movie. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, that's that's what I did, you know. And we even um, modded the rules slightly for yeah. you, though. We house ruled it just a little bit to kind of say that in exchange for you, because that, that particular class... Um, there's a power I think that you kind of just adapted where it would let you change sizes at will. Mm -hmm. Um, and we basically just made it so that instead locks you at your it locked me there. Yeah. To, so I could never apply. get that power, but I started out with with being small. So yeah. that that's that's one extreme, and uh, and I want to paint a a, a spectrum sure. here for you. So the other end of that, as long as you're still with that conceit of I want to do something like Lord of the Rings, and I also want it to be crunchy. We're talking lots of dice, very thick, that lots of heavy. That sounds more like where okay. I'm going. Yeah. Um, I would look into uh, Burning Wheel, Luke Crane's Burning Wheel. I think the gold edition is uh, his masterwork, and it is absolutely brilliant. And one of the great things about that final compilation is you can do the complex fight rules, or you can do the simple fight rules. And so you can have a 40-minute fight, or you can have a one single roll fight, and there's sort of options in between. And one of the things that I love about that system is that you have um, alternate ways of doing role play. For example, there's something that allows you to try to convince someone of something. And so you have this argument or think of it more as a debate, right? And there's a whole system. It's very similar to the fight mechanics, actually, hmm. where you will choose your action and I will choose my action and then we'll compare and if you fainted within the discussion and I uh, like insulted during the discussion, that's going to have a very specific mechanic. And then we role play it out almost like line for line. Think of it as, as beats in a conversation before the turns in the conversation. Rock, rock paper, scissors, role play? Actually, kind of, yeah. But there's about 10 different options. So it's actually more complicated. RPS, than RPG? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah nice. Um, so that... That's a system to look at, but again, that's really, really crunchy, and it's on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, and I, okay. and I, I with with Burning Wheel in particular, um, I think one of the the impediments there is the. Even though I like the character creation system, because to me that's honestly it's its own game. It's frankly. its own game, and yeah. I like I like that by itself. It's just here's the game, play, create a character, and yeah, see what you get. It is with life paths. Um, and I everything. like that. Yeah, I like that system actually better than the game itself. Um, but I feel that uh, that's 
kind of a pretty big barrier. You get together, that's one session. It's creating uh-huh. your characters. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. It really is. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for something that's more like um, Burning Wheel Light, I would recommend looking into a system called uh, Chronica Fidalis, which is, mm-hmm. or probably it's uh, Chronica Fidali, really. Uh, but it was inspired by Burning Wheel to be a Burning Wheel Light. Is it French? Um yeah, technically, it's uh, middle age Latin. Latin. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, it, it's it, it's romance language. Um, but I wasn't even going to say that one as my third one on the spectrum. You just your comment made me think of that. Uh, it's a great great thing to look into. Um, the the third one that I was going to put right smack dab in the middle, and this is going to sound absolutely nuts, but it's a system called role playing is magic. Huh. And yes, <laughs> it is. Over here. <laughs> I know and it, it is off of the My Little Pony franchise. Oh gosh. It's a fan game. Just give it a moment. Uh-huh. Oh god. But but here's the thing. Ignore the pony aspect, ignore the art is an incredibly solid system and actually it is of course basically fantasy with all these different classes and the idea behind it is you're a party and friendship is a mechanic. Um, built into the idea of we're going to have differences, but we're going to have to figure out how to work together. And it makes the story less about rolling to hit and more about um, figuring out what it is that your character does best in the context of the situation. Hmm. And I absolutely love the system. I think it is a brilliant system. Uh, We've played it a couple of different times. And uh, honestly, I've never been a horse. You know what I'm saying? It it doesn't matter. The horse thing doesn't matter. Um, so it also has a really interesting uh, magic system. Mm. Yes, um, you basically can do anything. Yeah, you can basically create your own spells. And what it does is basically it, it specifies for each of these different aspects, like, uh, you know, the range, um, the area of effect, uh, uh, whether it's like kind of an instantaneous thing or a prolonged spell. Um, there's a whole bunch of different factors. Um, it kind of gives you a different cost to execute it. So like you can kind of increase the uh, the difficulty of the spell for a greater effect. Um, but then the specific, like what happens narratively when you actually pull it off is actually very open ended. So yeah. they kind of give you these terms that, um, whatever it is you're thinking, you can kind of attach these tags to it in order to figure out the mechanical, uh, implementation while also having kind of a free form, um, narrative way of saying, I want to spell, it's not just, I cast magic missile and right. magic mm-hmm. missile does something very specific. It is, I'm going to cast whatever this thing is that I have in my head, I want this cool thing to happen. And you mm-hmm. just sort of figure out how to make that happen. There are rules for chaining spells and there's also rules for compounding spells. And so uh, recently, Will Parsons, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of him last episode, uh, he did the probably the single most amazing magical <laughs> spell I've ever uh, seen happen in a game. <laughs> and it was, he chained about five different spells together that were all incredibly simple. And it was uh magic shield and then uh, a drain and then another magic shield and then another thing. And basically it was, if at any point the other wizard that he was dueling with long distance didn't uh, succeed at uh, did, basically if they, if they ever like didn't detect that little part of the spell, then the rest of it would be completely masked and it would, it would drain her away. And just... it was kind of a trick where he was expecting that a wizard of her caliber was going to be able to see like the, uh, see past the first shield. Right. And here's the hidden effect. But then he had like another hidden effect underneath that, another hidden effect um, to the point where like, it was kind of just this mind game of eventually she gets to the trap that um, basically would make her the real age, trap, yeah. like a year for every minute or something like that. Yeah, that's what like, it was. Really, really crazy stuff. Yeah, it, drained, it drained her mana and then she couldn't prevent it and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. It was, it was really cool. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that whenever you're looking for a system, I think that the keys are to figuring out genre wise, what supports the tone of what you're looking for. Every, all the examples I just gave were fantasy, mm-hmm. right. And, and leaning towards Lord of the Rings. But, um, then more so than that, how much control is given, think of it as a control panel, how much control is given to the players and how much control is given to the GM. Um, you know, it's like you were saying before, um, how much rolling is going to be done by the GM and how much rolling is going to be done by the players. And, and that really changes things. Uh, it feels like you have more control whenever, uh, the player is rolling against a 10 and the GM has arbitrarily come up with a 10, the GM can basically force a thing and, and, and say no. Right. Whereas if the system says um, fours are successes, period, um, but sixes are resounding successes, you know, that's a completely different thing. It's like almost like the GM doesn't have the power to say no and it becomes more the character's story. If, you're, if your group can handle that, uh, that's great. If your group is going to abuse that, that game's going to get run into the ground very, very quickly. And it's going to go nowhere. 
and, and, and you need the restraints and you need the crunchiness and you need the thing where the GM can say, uh, no. And we mentioned uh, Blades in the Dark uh, mm -hmm. not too long ago. And one of the cool things about that is there's a, a way that you can just tell your players what you're trying is impossible. It, it's just flat out impossible. But if the player says, okay, then I'm going to do it a little more recklessly, then that shifts the impossible to unlikely. That kind of a thing. And there's this whole give and play of how dangerous are you going to be while you're trying it versus how successful is it going to be when you do it. And there's there's three tiers in each. And you declare that before the roll. In fact, you, you tend to only roll once or twice per scene as opposed to a sequence of chained rolls. And that's, I guess, where the last part of it is, is mechanically do the dice support what it is you you're trying to do. Do you yeah. want a massive handful of dice and to roll them? I love that feeling, but it slows the game down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like rolling dice as well. Um, but I also feel that, and I've noticed this too. Um, I kind of like the concept of you only roll the dice when you, the GM, neither the GM or the player really knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's when you pull yeah. out the dice. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and you know what? You just quoted Luke Crane. In, in Burning Wheel. Oh, okay, actually. perfect. Whether yeah. you realized it or not, right, you just did. I, I like the, if if the player can, you know, talk his way through something with the GM, mm -hmm. um, again, they go back to the example of the spot check. If they're able to, instead of having the role for that, they're able to talk through what they do, say they find they find the trap and they they decide they're going to go around it through conversation with the GM and figuring out um, how they're going to do it and describing their action and all that. There's no need for a role. You've right. already talked through what you're doing, and you've already come to an understanding of here's what's going to happen. Oh, you can do that? Well, you you clearly have the ability to do it, so okay, you do it. Right. As opposed to um, knowing that it has to come down to a roll. Because eventually, if if things are too bound by by rolling, I find that the game quickly dis d dissolves into, um, oh, I, I roll for that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's boring because – then it's like okay, I roll for that, and then they then what are you going to say? You got that they did it or they didn't, yep. and unless the system has all these extra rules about um, what different roles mean and like advantages, disadvantages, and partial successes and all that kind of stuff, um, you don't have as a much as much leeway. And if you have all that stuff, it's it's interesting, but the problem there is that um, then that makes it more complex. So you mm -hmm. have to have a really strong understanding of the rules to use a system like that. And plus the players are going to want that same understanding. So if you're just trying to play like a, a, a casual session or more casual sessions, and they don't really want to invest themselves in figuring out these complex rules, then, you know, they might give up. So it sounds like you're leaning more toward a rules light system. Yeah, but that stills allow that still allows for um for for roles when you have them. So mm -hmm. it, so it's not just completely abstract um collaborative storytelling but so there's there's still rolling that influences things like like an original dnd or like something sort of like what doc was saying possibly something like burning wheel might mm -hmm. be be along those same mm -hmm. lines um a couple that i'll mention to you that um partly come down to how the gm decides to use it they could use the role sparingly or they can use it way more frequently um are you looking for fantasy um specifically or are you kind of open to genre so i'm completely open mm -hmm. um i've i've found that whenever i um do more branching out into different genres. Uh, it seems like there is more interest in fantasy, just okay. generally speaking, um, sure in the group. But I love in, a good noir, personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably. Um, it's, I think it's easier with fantasy, to be honest, to find a lot of. It's a good diversity, starting place for diversity sure. Diversity yeah. of systems. Yeah. You know? Well, that's true. That's. De I would say a good third to two thirds. I I haven't done the math uh, out there. Sort of assume a fantasy element. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so one to look into potentially is the fantasy age system. Yeah. Um, mm. that is the same system as the dragon age tabletop RPG. Yeah. Um, but they, really? they, they huh. turned it into a generic system. Yeah, they did. Um, you can also see that played, uh, pretty interestingly on the, uh, the YouTube series, Titans grave, Titans grave, um, which kind of gives you a good sense of like what that system is capable of, hmm. uh, bearing in mind that what you're watching in like the 40 minute episode is actually trimmed down to the, the core of what was a three hour play session. Um, and so like that, that's one where it's an interesting system that can be played a lot like a D and D, um, but you can also kind of like take some liberties to make it a little bit lighter on rules too, depending on your approach. Have you ever played the star Wars fantasy flight? RPG? Yes. Um, I actually have, we did a campaign with uh, doc actually doc and mm -hmm. Richard yeah, and yeah, uh, back in the day. Yeah. So there's a generic version of that now called Genesis, mm -hmm. uh, gen like spell with a Y S at the end. Hmm. Um, and what that is, it's a generic version of that same system. 
Uh, and that actually has a few different kind of um, play sets, if you will. It stands um, for generic system. Yes. Um, <laughs> where uh, there's like a fantasy setting inside the book. And it's just one book. You don't have to like buy multiple books like you might with, say, GURPS. Right. Um, where they kind of give you the equipment lists and the move sets and all this different stuff to kind of support um, you know, fantasy, science fiction. I think there's like a contemporary one. I'd have to look again to see what all they include. And then you could probably, by reading that and seeing how they differ between the few of them, if you want to make something custom, probably wouldn't be too incredibly hard to um, translate that. But of course, they try to give you a bunch of stuff to work well, from. Huge fan community, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's not – if there's a successful system like that, it's not going to take long for the fans to step up and go, oh, I made a – and then you fill in the blank on, yeah. your, mm-hmm. on, your, on your setting. What I found particularly interesting, because I've researched Genesis just a little bit, uh-huh. um, is that it does use its own dice system. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. That, like, Proprietary I, dice. Yeah, um, which could be a little bit of a barrier for some people because then everybody feels like, oh, I have to go out and buy my own dice. Mm-hmm. But if you play in a group that, like, mm-hmm. especially is in person, you could probably just share mm-hmm. that set of dice. And I think the set of dice is only Well, actually, like I recommend $10. the app. Yeah, okay. it, you can get cool. a Star Wars dice app yeah, that includes the, app. Um, the, well, a bunch of different games it supports, but... Um, it also includes, and maybe there's even another dice up now that the Genesis is a thing and it's not just Star Wars specific, maybe Fantasy Flight released something for that. But essentially the dice are all the same. They just have different symbols and they mm-hmm. name them different yeah. things. Yeah, but they're not the, numbers, it's symbols. Yeah. Um, what 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 exactly are the symbols? There are successes, about? failures, um, threats, and advantages. That's neat. Yeah, and so it, <clears throat> from what I um, understand about triumphs it, and despairs. And I, I did look it up, by the way, there is a dice app specifically called Genesis Dice there from Fantasy Flight Games. Well, there, there you go. go. Cool. So. Uh, I imagine it's like uh, 99 cents or a couple dollars. It's actually five bucks. Oh, okay. It's, four worth, nine, it. Four it's, worth, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it because among other things, it will do the counting for you. Um, oh, really? It can get, oh, yeah, sure. It can get a little bit tedious when you roll this big old handful of dice to figure out like, okay, so this cancels that and this cancels that. Um, it will just flat out tell you here are the net values. And so it will say, you've got net four successes and net two threats. Um, as opposed to saying, uh, you got six successes, but five failures and eight advantages, but seven threats, you know, that sort of thing. It boils it all down. You it do boils have, it all down. You do have the negative aspect, though, of not feeling like you're controlling <laughs> the dice. Like, you're yeah. like, oh, I'm, I'm in control of what I'm going <laughs> to yeah. roll because it's in my hand. Yeah. Oh, but you can shake your phone and <laughs> make the noise. It, it has like a little physics engine where you can actually see them bouncing around on the That's screen. Right. Yeah, and it, even, it even vibrates a little bit. So but there you go. You get the feedback. I, I got over that. Um, loss of tactile <laughs> control very quickly, yeah. very quickly. It, yeah. it, it, it's like finally adapting to like reading on a kindle all the yeah, time finally yeah, yeah. There you go. It's like, um, I, like, I like turning the pages i like the smell of the book but oh man is this convenient right yeah. <laughs> uh, so one thing that i have noticed about both those systems because i've been researching both the fantasy age system and the genesis system recently um i actually got the i have it i don't have the core rule set for fantasy age uh but i do have the f- full core rule set for the dragon age system um largely because i'm a huge dragon age um, fan and so like I, I'm interested in running something in that um, and one of the things that you brought up Jim earlier is mm-hmm. like um, when you have things that roll a lot um, w- one of the like one of the core rule sets that I feel a tabletop game should do and should emphasize is encouraging things to happen and particularly encouraging the player to feel cool at pretty much all times there are times that they can fail but still make it feel narratively impactful not just simply like oh I want to do this thing I rolled I failed. I guess I didn't do it. Yeah. Um, that that that's boring both for the narrative and yeah, for the player. Yeah, it is. Um, and that was one of the things that I, I feel like Genesis kind of does, and especially like in Fantasy Age, which I've researched a lot more, um, that it does as well. And that it encourages with like it uses three d six for pretty much everything. Uh, it encourages just simply things to happen on both sides, both for the players and for the GM as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know if that would be something of interest well for said, you. Well yeah. said, yeah. And that's actually one of the things I love about um, Powered by the Apocalypse games is that when you have a failing role, quote unquote, that's actually just a chance for the GM to make a move. Yeah. Um, so th- basically, what, it's not really even so much a failure for the players, is a chance for the GM to say, here's what happens. Yep. Um, to failing kinda, forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And see, I, I like that concept. It's just, I feel like you, you shouldn't need to have that in the rules. You mm-hmm. just do it. Yeah. Like you don't yeah, need to have, now mm-hmm. I use my move. That's what I didn't yeah. like about, about masks. And it seems like a lot of the power by the apocalypse are kind of like that. It's like, oh, well, because this happened, now I can do a move where I can cause these things. Mm-hmm. Why don't you just do those things anyway? I, yeah. I, I can, I've been doing that in made up systems with very little rules. <laughs> and and that's already, one of the things so. too, or I, I've long argued that power by the apocalypse is a really interesting um, I, I, I like them for what they are and I go into it understanding what they are. Um, I also find that they're interesting as a way to ease people who are very used to, um, very by the book mm. rules, lawyery, crunchy systems. 
um, who want to experiment with being more narrative. It gives them rules that kind of like if you're playing the game properly and you're following the rules, you're going to get narrative. If that makes sense. Yeah, but no, if you're able to sort of generate narrative on your own, Th- then, then it feels restrictive. Yeah, that was my issue with it. It felt because mm-hmm. and I think that was why it didn't quite work was, um, you know, I have a group of people that are kind of used to that freedom and used to coming up with things on mm-hmm, the fly. Mm-hmm. And um, one of their two of them are, you know, have their own game studio and are working on games themselves. Mm-hmm. And one of whom is wrote a book related to one of the games. And so I've got people that are creative that like to, mm-hmm. you know, come up with different things. And so when you, when you're in that sort of group, you want to let them feel like they can do that without having, well, here's the rule for the, coming up with this narrative. Well, I don't, I don't want a rule. I just want to say something and you tell me if it works or not, mm-hmm. or let me roll and tell me if it works and what happens. Right. Well, if you've got a table full of GMs, then we've got just the game yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, a little bit to that point, because um, we've talked about different player types mm-hmm. um, yeah. and like kind of choosing games based on a, like what the players might want out of it. Uh, are they min maxers? Are they people who like really like crunchy stuff? Do they like to break the game? Do they like to, they do they like more narrative and never have any role? Um, I think that another element is: are they players that? Um, uh, don't trust the GM mm. and is it a GM that is right. that wants players to feel like that uh, so essentially is it going to be a GM that uh, openly either supports uh, the players or is against the players and antagonistic towards mm. the players and is it a group that's okay with that as yeah, well yeah. I think that kind of affects yeah. the game because that you if you too. yeah if you're playing the sort of game where you want there to be a feeling of threat and deadliness right. and um, like you're constantly in danger of stuff then having a GM that's a little bit more antagonistic in a uh, non-antagonistic way in a meta sense, um, it can be very good because you can kind of create this this sense of tension. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think you can have that though. Um, you can have that aspect of there's there's a lot of tension and it's very dangerous without feeling like the GM is out to get you. For sure. Because I, mm-hmm. I really feel that when you have that, it to me, it always does a disservice mm-hmm. to, to the it, game. It can I, create some some issues I want in you, the group. If, yeah. you, if you create challenges that are dangerous... Mm-hmm. But you are you are the neutral referee to, to, as to what what happens there, and the party decides we're going to go after this dangerous thing and we're going to confront it head on, even though clearly head on was the, was not a good option. They choose to do that. You neutrally um, through through neutral you know game mechanics, they still die or they fail or what have you. That's not really you being antagonistic, mm-hmm. but otherwise, but you could very easily, and some mm-hmm. GMs do that where they are they have this players versus gm mentality right, yeah. and i always feel that that's not good regardless of what kind of game that you're playing yeah. unless the game specifically is about we're going to beat the gm and even then it feels fake mm-hmm, because yeah. i always feel that the gm is the gm has control so if they want to screw you over <laughs> they, they can, can. Really yeah <laughs> so so if they're not screwing you over then it's like if the whole point of the game is you're gonna unless it's a game like uh, like a board game like um um, oh, what is it called? Is it Dread? I forget the name of the board game. Um, where where you're essentially playing against Descent. Descent. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Like Descent, where it, you know that's a board game where um, one person is controlling essentially the dungeon and all mm-hmm. the players are mm-hmm. trying to beat them. You know that's that makes sense. And but that's a board game. So Strangely, like, that's an older example. Now there are, mm-hmm. there are quite a few uh, newer examples of that. Yeah. In fact, um, I mentioned Gloomhaven. I was going to say our, yeah. I'm, I'm going to highly recommend Gloomhaven for those who enjoy a good dungeon crawl. Mm. And really want a GMless experience um, that goes on in campaign mode and feels like D and D. I've heard very good things about Gloomhaven. Mm-hmm. I've seen the box. Yeah. Um, can you uh, describe it a bit more? Um, well, yeah, it's a it's a legacy game for starters, which means that there's stickers that you put down on the board. There's stuff that you uh, destroy. Uh, the rules change over the rules time. Rules change over time. Your your characters change and level up. You pick which cards you're using based on that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, that said, uh, it's a little bit samey in terms of mechanics, but then so is D&D. Yeah. So um, I, I've really been enjoying it. I will go out on a limb and say that it is my favorite dungeon crawl game, board game that I have ever played hmm. because there are no dice. Yeah. And so I think, Jim, to the thing that, um, what you said about like kind of trying to create this, uh, like, you know, beat this, beat the scenario as it were, um, without feeling like the GM kind of just like lets you have it or kind of, uh, was out to get you. Yeah. Um, it, that's, that's it's where a balance is striking a balance. Yeah. yeah. And that's where having, um, supplements actually comes in handy, um, or scenarios that are pre-written because then you can kind of point to the book and say, this is how the game was designed. I'm just refereeing it. There's an objective thing. Um, that the GM can kind of point to um, to say, like, no, here's the objective um, third party thing that is not me telling you whether or not you win or fail. 
Um, it is the book telling you based on the way you played it, here's what would happen if that makes sense. And so, um, and even sometimes as the GM, if you're writing that yourself, just having it ahead of time so that like whether or not the players, um, feel the need to check you on it (laughs) in a way, but, but basically you can, you can even point to them or like show them like ahead of time, like I've pre-written this scenario or after the fact say, Hey, I want you guys to know that when this thing happened, that was actually based on this, not just you kind of, um, pulling something out of a hat. (laughs) <laughs> um, now, I think that there is uh, something to be said for having that balance between being able to follow a pre-written scenario and having some improvability, some ability to um, adjust on the fly. Um, but that is a thing that you could basically say, um, if the game is about beating the scenario, so to speak, um, that that can be a handy tool to use is those supplements. Yeah, I think it's uh, something I'm going to have to do with this group up front when I have whichever system I use and whatever plan I might try out a few different systems to see what sticks, but, um, definitely have to say up front, look, here's, you know, I've, I've prepared a few, um, maybe not, not just one quest. Of course, I don't plan to do that. I actually plan to have some options, but it's like, look, I've got a few options for quests here, uh, generally speaking or different directions that you can go. But, you know, if y'all want to go off completely off the rails, 100%, that's fine. But like, we're going to have the end to end the session so that I can prepare later so that I'm not just pulling everything out of my you know, but mm-hmm. for the whole session, which is one, very stressful for me, but two, it's going to seem unfair at certain points because I don't have anything prepared. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have to try to on the fly, you know, find a way to hodgepodge fit the things that I did prepare mm-hmm. to what you're trying to do. And I definitely, there is that element of, okay, we want to be able to do anything. That's great. But there is, there has to be that kind of give and take of, well, here's the adventure that you've agreed to go on and you have the ability mm. to go in some different directions and make some calls about how you approach it. But ultimately you are on a quest to do X and you have some choices on, you know, how you're going to co- accomplish that. But if instead you choose, no, we're going to ignore that quest 100% and do something completely different. Um, that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. There, there really are like, three things that you've got to have in a group Mm. and you, what you have to have is trust between that GM and the players. And you also have to have a system that fits the story that you're telling. And so really what you end up with, if you've got the wrong system for the type of story that you're telling, you're going to be breaking the rules a lot. And I heard you say that. Yes. You said, yeah, we're okay. Well, let's just fudge this or uh, we'll abstract this out or phrases like that mean you're using the wrong system. Probably. Um, and if you you have moments where uh, you know you cho- you got a choice, for example, in a hallway. This is like my my classic example. Um, you can go left or you can go right, and then you've got those uh, players who are like, "I'm going to blast a hole in the wall and just go straight." Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, if your GM is open to that, that's fine. But if he's not open to that, that's a problem. That's a disconnect between the GM and the players in that sense. And you, you blow a hole in the wall, a piece of rubble spins out cracks you in the head you get knocked out right there you go um and and you tell that joke but actually there are gms who would do that right, they would punish right. the punishment. player that, that's the way that you punish them for doing the impossible yes. right or and you make it clear you're that not impossible. supposed to do that exactly yeah. <laughs> or, or the yeah. you, you i'm gonna punch right through because i'm really strong you break your hand mm-hmm. you know yeah, like something exactly. like that yeah. right and so if if you're not careful you get into an antagonistic almost railroading type exactly. situation yeah where it's like um no you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you will fail at doing that. You have to go through the door I've put for you to go yeah. through. And I think that if you're using a system um, that is very dungeon based, then you understand there there might be a secret way out of this room, but probably there's a right answer and you've got to find how to disarm the trap and get past and then sure. solve the puzzle to get out of the room. And if the system is right, that's going to be fun. If the system is wrong, that's not going to be fun. Um, so to me, I personally would rather never play D&D again. Uh, what I would rather do is play a board game. And so my absolute favorite dungeon crawl board game is Gloomhaven. And I would love to uh, put that out because it's a legacy game. You put stickers down, you you tear up cards, you do all these other things. And to, for me, that's a fun place because then you're, you're fizz repping with minis, you're doing all of that stuff that you And there's do. also a sense of progression. Yeah. And there's story, there's deep story. You can choose where you want to go next. Um, all of that stuff. Everything that is fun for D&D for me is now pa- packaged into that board game. Incredibly, it's, it's almost an insult to call it a board game, frankly. Uh, I think it's a, a GM-less... Um, it's, it's a GMless RPG 
uh, that has a lot of physical elements. It, it seems interesting. I know that <laughs> no dice. That so far, I've I've struggled to get, and I've tried a few times to get the that group into his repping mm -hmm. in any sense, and they're just usually not interested in it because mm -hmm. everyone at the table has. And I'm not, I'm not saying people that, that fizz rep don't have a good imagination. I'm not saying that, but it just mm. feels like people are so into coming up with what's going on and having it described and saying what they do. It's like, we don't need, why do we need to get right. up and start moving yeah. around little minis? It's a very specific type of role play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so yeah. they're not really, and I, I kind of like the concept of fizz repping. I think it's really cool to, and we've tried it out a few times, but it always dissolves into, uh, you know where I am. Let's just, let's yeah, just move on. Yeah, it starts to become tedious kind of to some and, people. And, yeah. Yeah. and it's, it's just a different mindset. I, I understand. I kind of like it from a, um, you know exactly where people are and you're able to um, be a little more descriptive than you might normally be because everybody has the same picture of what's there mm -hmm. as opposed to you can't describe everything because it would just take forever to describe mm -hmm. everything in, in like minute detail. So there's some liberties that are taken and then you have you have to kind of go back and forth of, um, oh, am I going to accept the few liberties they took from the description as right. part of, yeah. And so there's a lot of that going on as opposed to everyone knows exactly what's in, in the area at the, at the space at the same time. We all play off what's there. I don't have to worry about, um, you know, Oh, I, they got to jump off a rock because, but the, I didn't say there was a rock there mm -hmm. versus, Oh, uh, they know that there's a rock there because you can see it. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's being fizz or described in some way visibly. Well, and I think to like both of y'all's point, um, that relationship between players and the relationship between the GM and the players is is really important and yeah. recognizing um, essentially where the middle ground is for everybody and cooperating to make the story happen yeah. and to mm -hmm. make the experience yeah. fun and yeah. happen. And trust. You know, you bring up the idea of, uh, um, you know, if you give the right and the left and obviously you want them to go one of the two directions and of course then they try to punch the hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. um, recognizing as the GM um, what type of players you have and preparing an answer for that um, or providing essentially an entire campaign that allows them to do things like that. Yes. If you know that they're going to walk away from the place that the bandits obviously are and just go wander in the forest, um, come up with a system. I'm actually playing in a game right now with somebody who is a GM that's essentially created an open world design, if you will, um, in which he actually does a lot of procedural things. And so there's certain areas that he essentially has a thing that could happen if you come across it, but only if you do these things. And if not, then he's just going to roll and it's going to be a random encounter of yeah. a wow. bunch of things that, that he has prepared. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And that seems more in line of, of what I would need because, you know, I have a lot of people that want to want to be individuals and want to go, yeah. want to go off and kind of do their own thing and not feel like they're being guided to do something. Um, so you say that's a system he came up with himself or is it, like yeah, I mean, we're just, yeah, we're just playing or... 5e. Um, and he essentially, he came up with, okay, yeah. See. Um, but, uh, essentially he, he, he wanted to, yeah, he wanted to do a more open feel. Yeah. Um, and so like we have a long campaign of which we know we just have to do a number of quests and then we'll finally succeed over the big campaign and get our goal. Mm -hmm. Um, but we can wander anywhere in the Island and technically we don't even have to follow any of these quests because he essentially has a lot of prepared encounters mm -hmm. um, and certain areas that are dungeons that we could come across on accident. So he has a lot of elements that are already prepared um, mm -hmm. that then just, then he gets to roll on it himself and decide, okay, I gave you this freedom and now this is where you're going to go because I, of I that. I think that's, that's kind of, I, uh, now that you mentioned it, I think that's sort of the strategy I'm going, I'm going to empl employ. Regardless of which system I use, I'm going to prepare um, different sort of, and it may not even necessarily be quest line, but different sort of like paths and things that could happen. Um, and probably put together a few tables of, of possibilities yeah. so that I can just roll against them. Um, so maybe I don't even know necessarily what's going to happen mm -hmm, per mm -hmm. se. Um, but that way you, you can get some random encounters, some random situations. Um, you know, they go to a town and I, I can quickly roll from a table. Um, the sort of, the sort of possible encounters or shops or places that they might get because that's one of the things that, uh, frankly, we have the most fun in is uh, towns, like interacting with people. Yeah. Um, because it's it's always kind of you know fun to see what what's going on in the town, what the people are thinking about. How do you you go into a shop and how do you you know essentially try to cheat the town out of literally every single great thing mm -hmm. that they have there? Mm -hmm. Do you never want to give too many good things? Are they going to try to you know you have to make the guards like crazy high level like uh, Skyrim or something where they're going to chase you all over the world. <laughs> right. Um, just because they're, you know, they're going to rob the place blind yeah. if they can, things like that though, they have that kind of extra random element I think is, is actually great. And I, I feel like that's something you could do 
for just about any system. Really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so that's just simply knowing the group that you have and just kind of having something prepared for when they do something that you didn't expect them to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And what this reminds me of is even if you don't end up using the full system, you might be able to pull some ideas from this subsystem in um, Dungeon World. They have what's called fronts. Um, and fronts are kind of these things you keep track of. They're happening in the world that your players may, not, may or may not be directly interacting with. But they're things where if you go on long enough without addressing it, here's what's going to happen. Um, and so like three sessions down right. the line, if you ignore the cultists off in the woods, <laughs> then suddenly Cthulhu is going to emerge or whatever the yeah. case might be. I love um, I love that concept where it's like you you give them the, OK, guys, here's your main quest line. It's, <laughs> you know, just destroy this. Um, you know, the lich is going to raise all the undead throughout the entire uh, uh, kingdom mm-hmm. if you don't stop them. And they just decide to do some other nonsense and mess around and help find stuff. It's like, all right, uh, it's been like four sessions. Uh, okay, all the undead have risen. You're now the world is now destroyed. Congratulations. Open world or, or, video <laughs> games need to do that. Or, or even oh, in, yeah. even if the world's so not destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. But like even if the world's not destroyed, the game changes fundamentally, yep. and it's now right. a new reality they have to deal with. Yep. And so I would definitely look right. at the front system, and even if you don't use that directly, maybe take some inspiration from it mm-hmm. um, if you're wanting to prepare ahead of time. Um, the other thing that I might just throw out real quick is the fate core system. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a game that if played correctly, um, can have this really good sense of tangible rules following, um, while still giving you a ton of flexibility, um, to kind of react to things, to plan ahead if you want to, but then also to, um, give the players a little bit of ownership too over, um, the way they want to play their characters and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, really great open-ended generic system. So yep. I would, I would consider that. And, and I love the spinoffs too. Atomic Robo is one of my favorite. Yeah. I was, ever. About, I was about to mention that we did a, uh, wasn't our first, uh, roll with it session was in the yeah, was Atomic in Robo. Uh, season two. Yeah. It was, it was oh, season two. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yes, we, we've, we've even played in that yeah. system before. I found it very interesting. Per, mm-hmm. per your idea of, of, sort of charts and tables. Mm. Um, I, I use something very similar to that, but a lot more abstract. I have what's called Rory's Story Dice, and there's mm. three or four different versions of huh. these. Um, Physi- but it, Physical dice? Yeah, they're physical dice with pictures on them. And there's a little game. It comes with rules. I don't even know how to play it. I don't care. What I want is to be able to grab a handful of these dice that have pictures on them, roll them, and I'll look, and I'll see, okay, it's a picture of an alien face, uh, a, a bridge... And a flame. Okay, so your random encounter is you come across a foreigner in this land uh, who's staring and screaming because there's a bridge that's on fire. What do you do? And I'll, I'll just use that as an inspiration for that moment for me, stuff that I would not have thought of naturally in my own head. And you can just you can have these amazing encounters that way. Uh, there was one time whenever I was playing in the Burning Wheel system and, and did that, and there was a gemstone that was found, and that gemstone was kept in someone's inventory for like six months. And then finally they got to a magical shop, and it was like, um, okay, so you know that gemstone that I have? And I'm like, which one? You know, the one I found in the forest. Oh, yeah, I remember that. He's like, I'm going to have it checked out. And so at that point, I had literally hadn't thought about it since then. But I'm like, okay... And roll for it, find out, and 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 it became a, like a major uh, secondary plot point, if there is such a thing as a mm-hmm. major secondary plot point. Mm-hmm. But that's the thing, is that if you have a really, truly rich world that is, it goes beyond the book, it goes beyond the, the text on the page, you can do some really cool stuff. And that's where I personally encourage people to sort of flex their improv muscles a little bit mm-hmm. and... Be willing to think about those things. It, it requires you to take a little bit more notes or let your players do it because they're going to take notes for the things that are important to them. Like that stone, that could have been nothing. We never would have thought of it again. But the person who found it, who's Richard, by the way, <laughs> Richard Worth, uh, yeah, he, he, he brought it up again uh, at, at a later time. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, all of that is to say that I think that you can, you can de-crunch any crunchy system with good role play um, and as long as you're all on board with, we're going to just kind of fudge this rule or ignore this rule, um, it can be done really, really well. But if you're doing it over and over and over, that might be a sign that you're in the wrong system. Right. That's, that's what we found with 5e, and that's why we eventually just kind of dropped it. For that reason, mm-hmm. we, we were finding that we were continually trying to do things that were that sounded really cool and interesting, but it's like, well, but you have to roll for this. Oh, well, you can't do it because you don't have, you know, yep. acrobatic yep. skills. So you can't yep. jump off this platform and land and yep. do like a crazy spin sword move. Well, why not? Oh, well, you don't have enough acrobatics. You fail the roll. It's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would suggest a more narrative approach where it's, 
it's not that you fail because you're bad at it. It's that you fail because of an, a reason that was unforeseen. Tell exactly. me what it is. Exactly. Not, not the, you don't have the right skill to do this. So it's really hard to do. And then you just mm-hmm. fail because you don't have the skill, but it becomes more of a storytelling mm-hmm. device. And doc, you just said something that I was also going to mention kind of in closing is that there are kind of like two approaches that we use a lot in our groups, uh, regardless of the system that can really help with this sort of thing. And one is the phrases you tell me and um, asking the question, uh, this sort of thing is going to happen, or I want to know something more about this city or something like that. Uh, I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about it and you tell a bit again, kind of coming back to you. Tell me. Yeah, um, we've had campaigns before where the GM helped uh, or we helped the GM world build kind of as he needed it. And it came, became sometimes like huge story hooks and stuff like yeah. that. Um, kind of like what are three rumors that are going around town right now? Yeah. And we each came up with a different rumor um, that was kind of playing to our sense of what we would find interesting. Uh-huh. And we were able to take that not only flesh out the world and have a sense of co-ownership, but also to um, give the GM ideas for things that he might not have come, yep. wanted, or come up with on his own. Yep. A, a great way to do that as the GM is to ask everybody at the table to throw in one detail about the place you just arrived at. That's mm-hmm. cool. Um, and then suddenly there's ownership. There's immediate emotional connection to it. Um, my my party would be uh, um, one small detail. Okay, um, it's got um, level nine spell wands just <laughs> yeah. kind of ha- littering the floor. <laughs> you know, the, the streets are paved with gold. You know, it'd be like th- they'd take advantage. So mm-hmm. I have to be careful with yeah. things like that. Okay. But 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 I agree. I like the concept. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah, that comes back to trust in your players, and it also mm-hmm. comes back to I think the buy in because um, you get to a certain point, and if you're really invested in the story, you you you're going to take it more seriously, and you're not going to necessarily push for things like that that's but very when true. you when you start to lose interest that's where it's you know oh i'm just gonna do whatever oh, oh i'm just gonna um you know kill the shop owner and take what's in the shop because mm-hmm. you don't care anymore and it's yeah. like well the guards might find you and kill you uh eh. mm-hmm. yep well and i think like you uh you guys were saying that can also be uh, like kind of get creative and don't be afraid to almost kind of break any system or yeah. just simply add what you want to any system mm-hmm. because like i know that is an element of i don't know if it's in all the powered by apocalypse but i know that is an element of dungeon world is they specifically tell you in like the gm book to mm-hmm. like never describe an area let let the players essentially create the area mm. on their own. And really in reality, there's no reason that you couldn't do that even in something as crunchy as mm. D&D. Sure. Um, Fellowship has an interesting example too, where um, I mentioned that each person's playing a different race or they come from a particular society or something like that. And that player is the owner of that society or that race's lore. Yeah. They have um, authority. And so if there's something you need to know about a dwarven tradition, you ask the dwarf, right? And the dwarf is the one who comes up with it. So even if you just own part of the game and the story. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. like that idea yeah. a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it really comes down to one guiding principle. Um, and it's just to kind of uh, use an example. Does the system have rules for initiative? Mm-hmm. If the if the system has rules for initiative, that tells me everything I need to know about the system. <laughs> if it has no rules for initiative, then that's going to mean that as players, you're going to have to sort of negotiate who, who does what and when. Cooperate. If it has rules for initiative then that means fighting is going to be a big part of it. If it does not, maybe you'll fight. Maybe you won't. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that that little, uh, s- that's the piece of sand that the pearl grows around mm-hmm. is whether or not that system was built around an initiative system. And I think that also plays into, you mentioned, um, you know, taking advantage of the ability to describe something. Oh, there are level nine ones scattering all over the floor. If you have a system in which that doesn't matter, um, if you have a system where the rules are driving more toward the narrative than toward uh, succeeding at tasks, mm-hmm. as it were, um, sure. then you sort of take away like mechanical incentive is actually narrative incentive. Yeah. Um, and you can start to avoid kind of like that sort of min maxing. There's no mentality. such thing as a level nine wand. What does that even mean? Right. Or, or if there is, it's a narrative thing. And right. Not exactly. A... Sure. I mean, you can, and you can mm-hmm. y- using that example, you can turn that into something that's interesting. Like, mm. sure, there's a bunch of level nine ones but they're all dead mm-hmm. and how do they all get here mm-hmm. and why are there so many of them and who used them all you know yeah. there's there's story mm-hmm. there that you could certainly pull from a gnome that with a duplication spell that went terribly wrong <laughs> they, they, they fell off the back of a carriage well thank you for joining us everyone for episode 127 of the podcast and hopefully jim you've got some good food for thought to uh, help with your uh your picking a system yeah i problem. think so, so. Y'all, y'all were very helpful I, i'm hoping that other people that are looking for a system and get some information from this too and, and kind of get some ideas about systems they could play in because yeah. we, 
I know y'all threw out a bunch of them. I'm probably going to have to go back and listen to this a few times to, <laughs> to jot down all the references. Well, shameless plug, be sure to listen to the Doc and Kruger cast too, because we talk about this topic in even more detail. Awesome. Uh, and if you listeners happen to have thought of a system that we didn't mention that you think is just perfect for uh, Jim's needs, uh, feel free to email us and let us know. But anyway, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. I'm Aaron. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.